swung with everything he had and he missed. Being the ump, of course, he decided, no, bugger this. I'm going to go for another wide. So he called it a wide. Third time, he picked up the bat and the ball and he looked at it and he said, I am the greatest batsman in the world. He took the ball and he threw it up and he swung at it and he missed. Realizing he can't call this one a wide, he, he called it an out. And he sort of sat on the brick and he looked at this lot. And then he looked up and he saw his parents watching. He says, Mom, guess what? I just bowled out the greatest batsman in the world. I must be the greatest bowler in the world. <laughs> the point of the story is whether you agree with me or not, your attitude to life defines your happiness. Your attitude to life will define how you live your life. It's going to define whether you have a good day or a bad day. It's going to define whether you have a good life or a bad life. It's going to define whether you have a good marriage or a bad marriage. Chuck Swindle, one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, said this. He says, words can never adequately convey the incredible impact that our attitude has towards life. The longer I live, the more convinced I am that, I, that life is 10% of what happens to us and 90% of how we respond to it. I like that statement because I can't live that statement, unfortunately. And many of us can't live that statement because life for us is 90% of how we respond to the circumstances of what happens in our life. Right. <laughs> and it's here this morning in the church where I'm going to open up a little bit of a can of worms. Some of you are going to maybe like what I've got to say. Some of you, maybe not. But I want to ask you a question. And you need to think about this, okay? What is your attitude right now towards the circumstances in your life? Hmm? What is your attitude to what is happening right now in your life? Last night, mine sucked, to be honest with you. But what, are you, what is your attitude right now towards the life that you're currently living? I'll tell you right now that there are people in this church, amazing people, who have the most incredible attitude to life, no matter what they're going through. They seem to just be happy. And then there are people in this church who, whose attitudes, to put it very bluntly, sucks. Okay? And if truth be told, not one of you know, or very few of you know what your attitude actually does for you or does to you. Any of you watch that show on, on Mnet called Chicago Fire? You watched the episode the other night where, where the Shay, the, the paramedic, got that new partner and everything was negative. Oh, this was going to be a disaster and that wasn't going to work out. And they were gonna... you, you remember that episode if you watched it? He was the most negative person in life. And the problem with people like that is that when you surround yourself or you involve with people like that, they pull you down. They will always pull the people around them down with them because of their negativity. And you know what happens to people like that, unfortunately, is people stop going to visit them. People don't go to them anymore. Because you've got enough crap in your life to be blunt without having to listen to some other oak pull you down. Am I right? Am I wrong? Okay? So people don't want to mix with people like that, unfortunately. And I've often wondered how many of you really realize on a Sunday morning that whatever attitude you bring through that door affects your worship experience? You're all nodding because you're all agreeing with me. Okay, Psalm 27, and I, and I want you to, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me, but otherwise it's up on the screen, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, okay, maybe not the, the best uh, presentation, but you can read it. Psalm 27. David writes this, and he's writing this in the context of his kingdom as being attacked by his enemies right now. And he writes this about his relationship with God. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The wicked advanced against me to devour me. In my, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. Now David was on happy pulls. Let's be real about this, okay? Because he was being attacked, okay? He was under a lot of pressure. I think this was before the whole naked chick on the roof episode in his life. So I'm not 100% sure where this happens, but I think it was, okay? Um, so, but, but he was at war. David was always fighting a war. Somewhere along the line, he was fighting for the kingdom of God. And it's important to understand that for many people in David's position, 
These things that cause fear and anxiety are the people who do not know or trust God. These things resulted in David not pulling away from God like so many of us do in the difficult times, but drawing closer to God. He says this in verse 4, and today I'm going to focus purely on verse 4. Um, I don't know whether I put it up. I'm not actually sure. I don't think I did. But anyhow, is there another slide? Oh, there it is. Yes, I did put it up. Okay. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, he says, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound like anything prolific or, or fantastic, but the lesson behind that piece of scripture is huge. For you and me. And you know what? This is such an appropriate piece of scripture. Because what was the mantra for the fast group? Seek the face of God before we seek his hand. What David was doing here is he was seeking the face of God before he was looking at God's hand. Now you need to understand something about David. I'm going to give you a quick history lesson about this man. He was the king of Israel. Okay, He wasn't a figurehead like Queen Elizabeth or something. He was not only the king of Israel, he was the commander-in-chief of all their armies. Okay? And on top of that, God decided that he needed to preach the word also. So he had three massive roles that he played with. Now, any normal person will cave under that sort of responsibility. So the question we, we really need to ask of David is, amidst all of this, how did you hold it all together? How did you hold all of this together without crumbling, without falling apart? And it's a question we need to ask ourselves. Because all of us here have got so much going on in our lives that we often ask ourselves, I, I have no idea how to hold all of this together. I have no idea how to, to keep all these balls in my hands and juggle them successfully. David tells us there's only one way to do it. There really is only one way to do it. And it's the same way that he did it. You see, David remains strong by maintaining an attitude of worship to which you should all go amen amen he kept it together by maintaining his worship of God no matter what his circumstances looked like he kept the worship of God you know I lay in bed last night and I didn't feel like coming to church this morning that was me saying I can't do this I can't do this anymore Needless to say, I'm here. And I, and I got out of bed, and I'm glad I came. Because what I did is, I, I brought, even though I'm leading worship, I, I brought in my life to maintain some level of worship of God who's putting us through all this. I'm going to tell you, and this is the money shot of my, my message this morning, that whatever attitude you brought through that door, you're going to allow it to affect your worship experience today. You are going to allow it to affect your worship experience today. If you are happy and you are in a good place, you're going to worship the God of love who loves you and pours all these blessings out of you. If you are the Helen with a spouse, cat, dog, telcom, escom, etol, exchange rates, reserve bank, economy, tenants, borders, leeches, and sponges, well, guess what? You're going to allow all of that to cloud your worship experience. You will. I did. Many of you do. And I'm going to wager this morning that if I asked you after the service, what was your experience of worship this morning? You say, well, hey, that wasn't quite what I expected. Then I'm going to say to you that you brought something into the church that shouldn't be here. You brought something, a concern, a worry that has overwhelmed you. And it's taken your focus away from worshiping the God who called you to this place in the first place this morning. So what I want to do this morning is I want to have a look at that verse specifically. And I want to show you six aspects, brief aspects of what the concept of worship looks like. We should be finished by 12. Um, and it's critically important that we grasp this. Because if you can grasp these simple six aspects of worship, your whole worship life will change. I mean, let me ask you a question. Can give me, somebody give me an adequate description of worship? Anybody? That's one aspect of it. I can't give you it either. 
because it is such a diverse and such a complicated and such a, a huge thing in the life of a Christ follower that it's difficult to put it into one sentence to, 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 to say to somebody who doesn't know God, well, this is what worship is. One person said surrender. All of you kept quiet. Why? Because somewhere in your mind, you're not 100% sure of what worship truly is. Am I right? And it's not because you don't care. It's not because you haven't read your Bible. But it's because it is such a difficult concept to get around. It's like me trying to preach the Holy Spirit to some people. Some people grasp it. Other people will struggle with that whole idea for the rest of their lives. Okay? So I want to take it and look at six aspects. And, and each aspect is... Uh, collectively will make up the whole idea of worship. The first thing, the first aspect is simply the discipline of worship. Now, you need to understand something about worship. It is no accident that worship, like giving, fasting, praying, and service, is a discipline. All right. Now, if it's a discipline, it is something that simply happens. I don't come here and uh, fall into worship by accident. I choose to come here to worship God. And in that choice, God connects with me. And I connect with God. And God speaks to me and I speak to God through music, through word, through scripture, whatever the case may be. It's a choice we make. But that choice is going to take a substantial commitment on your part. Okay? You, and I'm going to be honest with you, you cannot walk into this church sporadically, get here, lift your hands because everybody else lifts their hand in worship and expect God to talk to you. That's not commitment. You've got to be here regularly. It's a practice that you put yourself into so that you can draw closer to the God who called you here. Now I know some of you are saying, well, oh, come on. You know, play enough Christian songs and I get into the mood and I'm all la 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 la. Is it really a discipline? Absolutely. freaking lutely It is a discipline. And I'll tell you why it's a discipline. For the true worshipper of God, the people who, who understand the concept of who God is in their lives. For the true worshipper, worship entails you coming through that door and discarding everything that's on your mind right now. You're not putting them aside and leaving them out there. I know that often we say, well, leave your troubles at the door. I think there's a, Christ, a Methodist team like that or something. Um, yeah, don't let it interfere with what you're trying to do here. God will deal with those issues. You bring it before him, he'll, he'll deal with them. But God doesn't want you to come here and stand like this and go, holy, ho- oh, work tomorrow. Holy, holy, oh man, I don't got to go pay that. And holy, holy, oh, what am I going to do to you? Oh, I've got to get the kids to school at half past seven. The bloody traffic's killing me. Holy, 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 um, I wonder if I'm going to get paid this month, you know. I kid you not, that's what we do. That is what happens to our worship when we're not focusing on God. We have got to come into this place. We've got to put aside the distractions. God's asking for an hour and a half of your week to put aside this distract- these distractions and come and declare, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is, who was, who is to come. And not have anything else come piling into your head when that happens. Why? Because God wants your heart. He wants your mind. He wants everything of you. And he knows, Matthew 6, he knows the things you need and he will give you those things. But when you stand here in his time and in his place and you're thinking about a hundred other things when you're supposed to be worshipping him, that's problematic. That's hugely problematic. Well done. You want to take it? (laughs) You've got to get this. Very few of us attain this level of worship 100%, unfortunately. Very, very few of us will get to this level. I'll tell you why. Because we all live in an environment today that has so many things competing with my worship of God. We all live in an environment that is, is, is forcing us to make choices. Uh, I've got to worship God, but yo, I've got to get to church. I've got to wake up. There's these choices continually the whole time that you've got to make to, to, to come and worship God. David resisted the temptation 
of allowing all his duties and everything that he was busy with, the armies, the, the preaching, the, the, the kingdom, all those, he, he, he refused to let those things become a huge, a, a number one priority in his life. And he allowed God to be number one in his life. And that's how he got through it. He focused on God. It's the whole precept core of I am second. Put God first and everything else falls in behind that. He made God his number one priority. And it's this single-minded ability of David that made him such an amazing leader. Such a fantastic leader. Do you remember the whole story of David and Goliath? Big dude took on the Israelites, remember? David gets there. He's, he's a shepherd boy. And he decides, no, no ways. I'm not going to allow this to happen. All the armies, the, 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 the armies of, of Israel were standing there. And they were qu- quivering in their shoes because they were afraid of this giant. Because um, they just looked at this giant through absolute human and therefore flawed perspectives. Okay, David comes along. He says, "No, man, bunch of girls, suck it up. I'm going to do this for you." And he gets up. He's not, he didn't get it because he was a better soldier. He was a teenager shepherd. That's all he did. He used to kill lions with stones. Okay, it wasn't because he was a, 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 a bigger than Goliath. Goliath was the biggest dude in the planet at that point. All right, it wasn't because of that. But the motivation for David was, "You will not diss my God. You will not do that. I will not stand for it." And what does he do? He goes and he throws a stone at this giant and he kills him. Which goes to show that he was a man who knew how to get ahead. (laughs) I love that statement, sorry. (laughs) You could almost say that David was absolutely obsessed with his worship of God. And let me ask you a question. Who of you are obsessed in your worship with God? And Satan goes, told you. Hmm? There was a man who was obsessed in his worship with God. The application for us this morning is that for us as a church to maintain this discipline, it's going to take commitment. I'm not saying that you have to be a 300, well, no, 52 Sundays a year without taking a break. You're not going to get a certificate at the end of the year saying 100% attendance. I'm not saying that. Yes, things happen. Sometimes you can't make it. But you can't come to church mm, yeah, and then six months later and a year later and, and expect God to do anything in your life. You know? God is, is committed to you. He is. He's absolutely committed to you. But there's something that we, we forget about that. God needs us to be committed to Him too. Something that, that came to mind a week back or so was we have faith in God. Am I right? Okay. But guess what? And I guess none of you have ever thought of this. God has faith in us. That is such an amazing thing to believe. The God who made all of the universe has faith in me to do the right thing. So David was obsessed with worship. And the problem with, with this whole idea of worship is that something is happening in the church at, the, at this point, which unfortunately is fulfilling one of my biggest fears for the church right now, especially the, the evangelical movement. It is that the church is becoming far too man-centered, and we are not God-centered enough. I'll tell you why I say that. One of the primary uh, 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 um, questions evangelism asks is how can we get more people into the church how can we boost our numbers it's not a numbers game all right Uh, and we we ask that because we have failed to recognize that the measure of success of our churches is not being set by the word of god anymore it's being set by our culture why do i say that well because bigger is better and those pastors who have these mega churches well they obviously know what they're doing because they've got these huge blessed churches they know what they're doing. So, so because they're bigger than us, they have the right to speak into the smaller churches and set the, 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 the pace for us to, to, to run after. You see, what we have failed to, to understand as a church is that we have bought into culture, uh, culture's idea of success. We have bought into culture's idea of success. And what's happening is church services are not, no longer being designed for the people here. <laughs> it's being designed for the people out there. And you know what, that sounds all nice and good, but it's not. It's not. And I'll tell you why it's not. 
Because when the, ch- when, the, when the people out there say, well, you know, we want more singing and less teaching, then the church changes its stance to do more singing and less teaching because we need more people. When the, church, when the people out there say, we need to be taught more about how to live life and, and less theology and less doctrine, to which I say, like hell we do, because we do. We, we speak about what I'm saying to you right now is that we as a church will not succeed in our worship when we are more worried about man and his opinion than we are about God and what he wants. The second aspect of, of worship destination, is the destination of worship. Now, the one thing we, we asked this morning is, well, you know, what did David seek? We, we, uh, sorry, is that screen? Uh, the, 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 what's name up again? What was, he, what was he looking for? In all of this worship, what was he looking for? The next one. He says, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him In his temple. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And it raises an interesting question. Where do we worship as a church? Where do we worship? Ultra conservatives will say to us, well, we need to worship purely on on, on consecrated ground. Conservatives will tell us, but no, worship can only take place in a church, in these four walls. And if we listen to David's words, well, we almost agree with him, don't we? Because he wants to worship and he wants us to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives. Now, we know the house of the Lord to be what? The church. The church, am I right? Okay. Let me break down what David was actually saying. Here. Firstly, um, David says that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Okay, so, so who of you live in a church? Okay, safe to say none of us, all right? We don't live in a church. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to understand. Secondly, um, as we saw yesterday, is this place eternal? No, it's not. Was the tabernacle eternal? No. Was the two huge, massive temples that were built in Jerusalem eternal? No, they weren't. Nothing is eternal. And it's important for us to grasp why these places weren't eternal. If we turn to Matthew 23, just one chapter or four chapters back, verse 6, he says the following. He says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Okay, now let me get this straight. If David wants to live in the house of the Lord, and the house, these, these places, these churches we are in, are not eternal, how can he dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Make sense? Nothing is eternal. So you can't live there for eternal, for, for eternity. You see, David knew that he was going to die. Like you and me, he was going to shuffle off this mortal coil. He was going to die. And he knew that the destination of all people, this side of death, that side of death, is the same. Okay? Depending on your choices, of course. All right. So for David, he comes to a true understanding that the house of the Lord isn't a place of brick and mortar, but it is a place of relationship. It is a place of a relationship with God. David was speaking about an ongoing and intimate relationship where he would live in the presence of the God that he loved 24-7. You know, worship for us is, in, in the modern day church is a journey. We need to understand it and we're going to use the, Old Testament, uh, the New Testament temple as an example. When we get here in the morning, we're in the outer courts. Okay? We're in the outer courts of the church. So we come in and through music and scripture and preaching, we are drawn into the inner courts of the church. In temple. We are drawn into this place. That is where we begin to connect with God. And at one point or another, if you have the discipline of worship and you're, you're disciplined to follow through it, you are drawn into what we call the Holy of Holies. Now, there was only one person that was allowed into the Holy of Holies. That was the high priest. Okay? Um, and that was where God, this is the symbolic throne room of God as we understand it. All right. So that is the journey of worship. We go from the outer courts to the holy place and then into the holy of holies. And that is where we commune with God without distraction. That is where we allow ourselves to to be spoken to and we can speak to God without anything getting in the way. The problem for most of us, however, is we don't get past the holy place. We don't get past this gathering. Because as I said just now, we have a hundred other things coming in and, and rushing through our minds the whole time. I'm going to say to you this morning that if your worship does not take you to the throne room of God, then one of two things have happened in your life right now. You have worshipped something that is not supposed to be worshipped, or you've approached the throne of God with ulterior motives. That's the only two reasons why your worship won't work. 
You have come to God, you come to your worship, and you are worried about money. You are worried about something else. You are worshipping your income. You are worshipping your stuff. God is not on the throne of your heart. Or you've come here and you go, holy, holy is the Lord. Lord, I need a Lamborghini. Your motives are totally incorrect. And I'll tell you something right now. God does not honor those two motives when you come with those attitudes. This is hard teaching this. And I think it's time the church gets to know this. The third aspect is the object of worship. I think one of the greatest hindrances to our worship, to what we do, is that none of us has a clear picture of what God looks like. There's only three people, I think, that know, well, four people, Jesus included, but I won't talk about him right now. Three people who, who, who sort of knew what God looked like. Adam and Eve used to walk with him in the cool of the evening in the garden. They were the first two. And A, Moses, I keep getting the two mixed. Moses briefly turned his face into a crevice and he saw the trail of God go past him on Mount Sinai. He, he glimpsed him. He never saw him. We cannot see God. Why? Well, because God tells us that if you see my face, you will die. You will not live to talk about it. The Christ follower who comes to understand the concept of God and who God is, is the Christ follower who has taken the concept of faith and applied it to his life. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us the assurance about things we cannot see. You cannot approach the throne of God in worship without faith. You can't. Unless you are so hard-hearted and you think you can con God, you cannot come to his throne room in worship. I say this because we are a visceral species. We need to see things. For us to look at something, uh, if I can see it, therefore I know it exists. And so what happens is very often we replace the God who we can't see with the stuff we can see. Money, stuff, abilities, family, and all those other things. And we worship that. Well, why? Because we can see it. We, we can feel it. We can work with it. Now, we all know, yeah, this morning, that God is supposed to be number one. But who of us can honestly say that God is first in our life right now? I can. Why is nobody putting their hands up? Or why is very few people putting their hands up? Because you know that God has to be first in your life. I mean, the whole I'm second priesthood. Who are you wearing these bands right now? If you're wearing this band, then you've made that decision that God is number one. So why don't you put your hand? I want you to think about your life quickly. What is the most important thing right now other than God in your life? Hmm? You got that? Okay. He has the cracker. Where does it feature in relation to God right now? The fourth aspect is our motivation for worship. It's a simple question. Why? Why do we worship God? Yeah, remember the Old Testament? Cain and Abel come and they give their offerings to God. And uh, God is not so happy with Cain. Why? Not because of grain offering. Not because he gives him grain instead of animals. Grain offerings have been given in the Old Testament on, on a number of occasions with great success. God is upset with Cain because Cain's heart wasn't right. And this is applicable to the whole idea of giving and tithing. If you give to the church with a grudge or the heart, then I don't want your money. And I'll tell you something else. God doesn't want your money either. Your heart has got to be the motivating factor for you to give to sacrifice to God. Cain comes to God and he does it. He's full of jealousy. He's full of anger. And God, you know what happens to him. Understand this. It is very possible for you and for me to come into this place and worship God in a way that is not approved by God. It is very, very possible. In fact, I'll tell you that it happens in every church every Sunday of every year. And Jesus had a huge problem with the Pharisees in Matthew 15 with regards to this. For them it was all about the show. For them it was all about how they were honoring God through their actions, through their works. Meanwhile, Jesus says, but no, you don't honor God by all this nonsense that you get involved in, this 
this, this, this doctrine that you, that you do. You honor God when you love other people, when you furiously begin to love other people. Now, this, this is the first week of furious love, uh, and I'm not going to touch too much on the furious love concept, but I'm going to tell you something right now, that worship, true, absolute, pure worship, is the, the most difficult form of furious love. When you kneel down here before that cross, you are furiously loving a God who isn't on that cross anymore. You are furiously loving God for what he has done for you, although it's 2,000 years ago. You are loving God outside of the concept of reality. That's what furious love is all about. There's an illustration of someone who furiously loved God right to the very end. It's an old lady dying, lying in, in her bed. She's gradually starting to lose her memory. She's, she's dying. She's passing away. And throughout her life, she loved the Word of God. She used to memorize entire pieces of Scripture. Her favorite being 2 Timothy 1.2. It says the following, I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. As she lay confined in this bed and she was getting weaker and weaker, uh, she started forgetting some of the scriptures that she had memorized. And, and this specific one, she started losing bits and pieces of it. And so it ended, sort of started off with, I know in whom I have believed he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him. And then the next, week, next day, it would be, um, uh, you know, it, it would be, I was uh, able to guard what I've entrusted in him. And about a day or two before her, all she could say was entrusted to him. Entrusted to him. And a couple of minutes before she died, all she could say was him. 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 See, for her, him was enough. For her, him was all that she needed. The fifth thing is duration of worship. Psalm 27 verse 4 says, ends in these words, all the days of my life. Let me tell you a secret and don't tell all the other churches because they're not going to get this. Worship doesn't happen here between 9 and 9.30. Okay, you got that? Doesn't only happen here between 9 and 9.30. All right. There is not a lot of things. In fact, there is only one thing that you will take with you when you die one day. And that is going to be your ability to worship the God who made you. It's going to be your ability to worship the God who made you. And David could think of nothing better than spend the rest of his life dwelling in the very presence of God. What I'm telling you this morning is worship. It's not confined to the service. It's not a momentary experience. It is a 24-7 experience that you are involved with the whole time. Um, when you are standing in, the, in the, the shopping queue at Checkers and you're waiting for 50 trolleys in front of you, worship God. Praise Him. Ah, oh Lord, thank you that I, can, I have the ability to purchase these things, to feed my family. Lord, I just love you. I worship you. I praise you. When you're standing in the bank, when you're on the, on, on, holding on the line for Etol to give you your balance, praise God. I know it's difficult, but praise God. Worship Him. It's a 24-7 experience that we, learn, we need to learn to get involved with. In Psalm 34, verse one, three, uh, 34, verses 1 to 3, David provides us absolutely fantastic model of what worship looks like he says firstly that worship we worship god willingly you give your worship as a sacrifice to god it's a love offering to him god doesn't force you to worship him you choose to do so secondly that we worship god continually in your car in your office in your home wherever continually worship god play music play christian music keep a bible in your in, in your briefcase do whatever you have you have to do okay Thirdly, that we worship Him personally. Worship isn't collectively just you and me here. It's you and it's me and it's you and it's you and it's you and it's you. In our own time, we worship God privately. And then he also says that it is also corporate worship together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. The final uh, aspect is the desire of worship. David tells in four that I am to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. What is the desire of, of, of David's heart? To gaze upon his beauty? What does that mean? To, to see something. David wanted to see something. Yeah, he wanted to see God's face. His face, you're absolutely right. And to... Seek him in his temple. So the two things for David, the des his desire in worship was simply to see God. Obviously, 
through his worship and to seek God. Now, if you come to the throne with any other motivations, I'm going to tell you you've got a problem. Your worship, your desire for worship is not about what God can do for you. It's not about Him forgiving you for your sins. It's not about Him sanctifying you, rectifying you, electrifying you. It's got nothing to do with all those things. Your worship here and your worship when you go into a time of worship is about seeing His face and seeking His presence. Does it sound so difficult? It doesn't. But we need to learn to focus. We need to learn to focus our, 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 our worship on the one we come to worship. In his book, uh, in his book uh, Sahara Unveiled, uh, an author by the name of William Langvisher tells the story of an Al- Algerian named Lag Lag and a companion who drove across the desert in their truck. They nearly died because the truck broke down. And for three weeks they were staying with this truck. They couldn't move. Lots to eat, but they had nothing to drink. And when they were finally found, they asked him, well, how did you guys survive? He said, well, you know what? We drank the radiator water. Now, just how desperate do you need to be to drink water with antifreeze in it and rusty bits and pieces from the engine that hasn't been serviced for 50 years? How desperate do you need to do that? Very desperate. But what, what William Langish says is, this is what worship should look like. We should have such an unquenching thirst for God that we would, we, would, we would drink whatever God gives us. Psalm 100 and... Where was it? Ah, I can't remember the psalm right now. But you know the psalm. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. That is what worship is all about. As the deer longs for water, so I need to come here and my heart must be quenched. My thirst must be quenched by the love of God I receive when I kneel down at the cross. That in essence is what worship is all about. It's a difficult journey. It's a very, very difficult journey. And it's a journey that I haven't got right. And I'm going to say to you that most of you probably haven't got right either. It's a journey, I'm going to tell you right now, that God doesn't expect us to get right. As long as our heart is right, we come here, we do what we we do before the cross, and we do it with the right motivation to see Him and to seek Him. That's what true worship looks like. We end our fast this uh, this morning, uh, 21 days. It's been difficult, but it's been amazing for all of us. Um, and we're going to end it in, in the only right way that we can, through Holy Communion. I'm sorry that we're a little bit longer than I anticipated. That David took too long sharing. Um, okay. <laughs> Always one. <laughs> um, so we're going to go to a time of communion. Um, yeah, break your fast in, in, in the right way. If you have been fasting, if not, approach the table of, of, of God's grace and God's mercy and God's love in the right way. And... Um, Come and ask him just to, 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 to show you or reveal to you how you can improve and, and how you can work through your worship of him. Um, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, um, he sat down with, uh, at, at dinner with his, uh, his disciples. And on the table in front of him was, was a loaf of bread. And he took this loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. This is the symbol of, of, of my body. And remember, they still had very little idea what was going to happen to Jesus the next day. He said, this is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. And I think that the disciples again sort of looked at each other and going, huh? what's he on about? He said, do this in remembrance of me. Okay? So he took the bread and he broke it. Now, we're going to go real Jewish here today. The fastest favorite friend. Um, he took the, the, the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, broken for you for the forgiveness of all sins. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the cup and, he, and he, he held it up. He said, this, if you look at this, this is the blood of the new covenant. Spe- uh, shed and spilt for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this also in remembrance of what I have done for you. 
And so Jesus gives us the model for the first Holy Communion. It's a holy moment. We are told in Mark, if we disregard this moment, we will get punished for it. Um, it's a holy moment. Let's treat it as such. Come up as a family, come up as however you feel led, and partake of the table. The invitation is open. It's here for the forgiveness of all sins. It's here because God loves us. It's here because God is pouring his grace out over you and me 